Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India While studying linear algebra, you may have come across the notion of tensor products. And uh, tensor products lead to the construction of a very interesting algebra called a tensor algebra, which is what I'm going to talk about in this lecture. But before we talk about uh, the tensor algebra, let me recall for you what a tensor product is. So we're going to fix a field F, and all our vector spaces are going to be over F. And let's say V and W are vector spaces, let's say finite dimensional vector spaces over F. And say uh, V has a basis V1 dot 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 Vm, W has basis W1 dot 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 Wn. Then uh, the tensor product of V and W is, uh, can be defined to be the vector space, let's define it, the vector space, F vector space of course, with basis and I'll just give some symbols, I'll write down some symbols, VI tensor WG where i goes from 1 to m and j goes from 1 to m. So if v is an n-dimensional vector, m-dimensional vector space and w is an n-dimensional vector space, then by definition v tensor w is an m times n-dimensional vector space. Now there is something slightly unsettling about this definition, it is that the tensor product of v and w seems to depend on the choice of bases of the vector spaces V and W. This is uh, of course not something that should happen, the tensor product of V and W should be independent of the choice of bases of V and W. If you change the basis, you should not get a different tensor product for these vector spaces. So uh, let me address that issue and see what happens when you change uh, vector spaces, uh, when you change bases of these vector spaces, you would get a different, maybe a priori different notion of a tensor product. But these two turn out to be essentially the same thing, we can identify them. So one important um, uh, thing to note before we go on to identify them is that um, you have this, um, you can define a map on bases, let's say B, which takes um, Vi comma Wj. So you take this basis, cross this basis and send it to Vi tensor Wj. This extends uniquely to a bilinear map from V cross W to V tensor W. Um, so V cross W is just the Cartesian product of the vector spaces V and W and um, we, um, so we, we think of it um, as pairs, one element in V and one element in W. And how do you define B uh, from V cross W to V tensor W? So what's a typical element of V cross W? So if we have a typical element of V uh, cross W is of the form uh, V comma W where V is in V and W is in W. So if V is uh, a vector in uh, capital V, then V can be written as summation um, AI VI, I goes from 1 to M, expanded in terms of our basis, W is BJ WJ, J goes from 1 to N. And then we can define B of V comma W to be, so it's B of summation i equals 1 to n a i v i comma b j w j 
j goes from 1 to oops this is m j goes from 1 to n and using bilinearity you see that this is forced to be summation double summation i goes from 1 to m j goes from 1 to n a i b j b i tensor so this is the map d from v cross w to v tensor w this is not a linear map it's a bilinear map and uh, it's also not a surjective map not every vector in um, v tensor w is of the form uh, uh, b of v comma w and this b of v comma w is usually denoted by v tensor w and this is exactly what it is okay so what i'm saying is that not every vector in v tensor w is of the form little v tensor little w for some vector v in little v in big v and some vector little w in big w i leave it as an exercise for you to check that when v and w are not um, uh, say let's say they are two dimensional vector spaces okay so that's uh, the definition of tensor product but what happens if we start with a different base so if instead we used a different basis let's say v1 prime vm prime of v and w1 prime wn prime of w then we would get a different notion of tensor product a priori different notion of tensor product Um, so it would be let's call it v uh, tensor w but i'll put a square bracket to say that this is with respect to square around the cross to say that this is with respect to these new bases v prime and w prime and you would also get um, a bilinear map v prime from v cross w to v tensor w so this v square tensor w would be the vector space with bases v i prime tensor w j prime and b prime would be dis defined exactly how b is defined except that we would use this other basis but what i want to say is that these two vector spaces are somehow or these two notions of tensor product are somehow the same we can identify the vectors in one with the vectors in the other um, very naturally so to do this let's just firstly uh, take vi so this is an element of v and so this element can be expanded in terms of any basis of v so let's expand it in terms of this basis v1 prime v2 prime dot 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 vm prime so this let's say is equal to k goes from 1 to m a k i p prime k and similarly let's say wj is summation l goes from 1 to n b l j um, w l prime okay so uh, now what do we have we have i'll do, draw it somewhat schematically one thing we have in common for both these uh, definitions of tensor product v cross w that that is not changed and then we have these two notions of tensor product v round tensor w and then there's this bilinear map b and then we have this other b prime and we have v square tensor w and i want to say that these two are related in the sense i'll give you um, an isomorphism phi from this vector space to this vector space which will make this diagram commute in the sense that phi circle b is going to be b prime and what is this phi it's not difficult to write down phi i'll define it only on basis vectors of v i tensor w j and it's suggested by these expansions it's just going to be summation k equals 1 to n l equals uh, k equals 1 to m l equals 1 to n a k i b l j v prime k tensor w l prime 
this is sort of forced by requiring that b prime is phi circle b and so this is a unique uh, map from here to here and you can construct its inverse in the same way you use the expansion of the v prime basis and the w prime basis in terms of v and w basis respectively and construct a map going the other way and uh, it's going to be an inverse for this map so these two vector spaces turn out to be isomorphic okay we are not going to in any seriously uh, serious way use these uh, notions there's also something called the universal property of the tensor product which i won't go into right now but in some sense tensor products are basis free okay but for us it's enough to just think of the tensor product of two vector spaces uh, in terms of basis you have a vector basis of these two vector spaces then the tensor product is somehow a vector space with basis uh, sort of a cartesian product of the basis of the two vector spaces this uh, notion of tensor product can be applied to several vector spaces so suppose you have um, v1 v2 up to vr are vector spaces and let's say uh, vi has basis um v 1 1 Uh, let's say vi1 up to vi um ni so the ith vector space has dimension ni for i goes from 1 to r then uh v1 tensor vr can be regarded as the vector space with basis um v1 i1 tensor v r i r where um i j is lies between 1 and n j so j equals 1 to r this is a vector space whose dimension is the product of the dimensions of the vector spaces v1 v2 v r and um, it's uh, not difficult to see then with this definition that if we have vector spaces v1 up to vr and then a few more vector spaces vr plus 1 up to vr plus s then um v1 tensor vr we take this tensor and then tensor it with the other tensor vr plus 1 tensor vr plus s this is the same as the vector space v1 tensor all the way down to vr plus s so um this is just you know because these things essentially have the same basis just think about it a little it's quite clear okay so now let's apply this to a single vector space v whose tensor product we take with itself repeatedly so now given a vector space v let tv uh, let's say tdv be defined to be v tensor v tensor v tensor v this taken d times okay and uh, what we have is that trv tensor tsv is isomorphic to t r plus s right for all r s greater than or equal to 0 ha at this point i should say something about what is t zero v so t zero v we will take it to be by definition just f the one dimensional vector space um f over f 
And now we are ready to define the tensor algebra. So, so this is the algebra TV. It is defined to be an infinite direct sum. D goes from 0 to infinity T dv. So this is uh, the tensor algebra as an additive abelian group. It's just an infinite direct sum of vector spaces. And how is product defined? So product is defined uh, by, uh, by linearly extending the map uh, on graded pieces. So what we do is define a ring structure on TV by if you have um, X belongs to TRV y belongs to tsv then x dot y is the image of x tensor y from trv tensor tsv to tr plus s this remember was an isomorphism so the image of x tensor y under this isomorphism and of course this only defines multiplication of elements which are in these summands but uh, you can define it for those are called homogeneous elements but you can define it for any element just by requiring this um, um, multiplication to be a bilinear map. We we'll look at it very concretely um, using some examples. But firstly, oh, what is the unit? So we need to check that this is an algebra, that it's um, associative, additive and so on. Um, I won't go into those steps. You can try to check it yourself. But the, uh, let me just point out that the unit of TV is the element 1 belongs to F which is t0. So the unit lives in uh, the degree 0 part t0. Let's look at the simplest example of a tensor algebra. Let's take v to be just the one dimensional vector space f over f. And uh, the basis of v is let's say just pick an element you could take the element one okay. uh, but let's call it e so some element e of f if you want you can take the unit of f then what is tdv tdv is v tensor v tensor v taken d times and its basis is just um, singleton 2 it's just the singleton set e tensor e tensor e tensor e taken d times let's call this e to the d just define it to be e to the d then e to the r times e to the s is the image of e tensor e tensor e r times and e tensor e tensor e s times in t r plus s so that image is just obtained by doing this and so this is e tensor e tensor e r plus s times so that is e to the r plus s so uh, what we have seen here is that tv or let's say t of f is isomorphic to the polynomial algebra 
in one variable which we can call e this isomorphism is simply defined on basis elements by taking e to the r or rather e tensor e tensor e r times to e to the r so the tensor algebra of a one dimension vector space is a commutative algebra it's just the algebra of polynomials in one variable now let's look at uh, the more general example which is basically also the most general example for finite dimensional vector spaces every vector space is isomorphic to f to the n every finite dimensional vector space is isomorphic to f to the n for some n so let's just take v to be f to the n so then this has coordinate basis let's call it e1 e2 en so ei is the ith coordinate vector it has 1 in the ith place and 0 everywhere else and tdv has basis given by ei1 tensor eid where i1 up to id this belongs to each of these lies between 1 to n and their d of them okay so this basis is in bijection with um, uh, words so consider um, an alphabet a so um, we'll just regard this letter 1 to n as an alphabet like in english you have 26 letters in the alphabet let's take a language where you have n letters in the alphabet and a word in the alphabet is a set of all words in the alphabet a so a word is just something of the form i1 i2 id where i1 id belongs to n so this basis is in bijection with i1 id words of length d in the alphabet one to n for j equals one to b so the basis of tdv is in bijection with words of length d in the alphabet one to n you've seen these words in an alphabet before when you studied uh, free groups so before you constructed free groups you constructed this object called the free monoid let me just recall for you what that is so the free monoid well a monoid is basically a watered down version of a group it's a set with um, an associative uh, binary operation uh, and that binary operation must have a unit but the difference uh, between a monoid and a group is that in a monoid we do not require each element to have an inverse and while trying to construct the free group uh, the first approximation that you saw was that of the free monoid and this is exactly what we're talking about here so so a n star as i said this is going to be so yeah maybe just a star is going to be all words of the form id i1 id belongs to n and d can be greater than or equal to 0 so if d is 0 then there's only one word namely the empty word of length 0 and the product operation on a star so it's a function from a star cross a star to a star is the concatenation product
so concatenation of words means if you have two words um, uh, you just write one word and then write the next word after it okay so the concatenation of free and monoid is the word free monoid so it's just i1 i l if you want to multiply it with j1 jm it's just the word i1 il continue on j1 jm so this is the word um, of length this is a word of length l plus m this is clearly associative it has a unit namely the empty word but it lacks an inverse when you have a monoid like this you can define an algebra so we'll define the monoid algebra I'll call it a ring actually well so I'm using the word algebra to denote a ring whose uh, additive abelian group is actually an f vector space and whose multiplication is f bilinear so you have this monoid algebra f a n star so this is an f vector space with basis Uh, well, maybe I'll give names to those things. 1 sub w, where w is a word in A and star. So essentially, the basis of this vector space is indexed by elements of the monoid A and star. And multiplication, so addition is, it's just a vector space, so you use the vector space addition. And multiplication is defined by bilinearly extending. If you have 1 sub w and you want to multiply it by 1 sub u then it's just going to be 1 sub w and then you this is defines a bilinear map on basis elements and so you can extend it to a uh, bilinear map on vector spaces rather it defines a um, function on basis elements and so you can extend it to a bilinear map from f a n star cross f a n star to f a n star and uh, this tensor algebra of v uh, of f n that we saw on the previous page um, is isomorphic to f of a n star via the isomorphism e i 1 tensor E i n goes to 1 sub i 1 i n. This is easy to see from the definitions. So the tensor algebra is the same as, uh, well the tensor algebra of the vector space f to the n is the same as the um, monoid algebra of the free monoid uh, on n letters. Having constructed the tensor algebra of a vector space, a little more work can lead us to the construction of a very beautiful algebra called the exterior algebra. This algebra is the quotient of the tensor algebra by a certain two-sided ideal. So you start with a vector space V and you take its tensor as Let V be a finite dimensional vector space over F and T V be the tensor algebra of V. Now inside this algebra I will take I to be the two-sided ideal generated by vectors of the form V tensor V where V is in V well tensors of the form V tensor V so this this uh, this these are all inside um, V tensor V which is T2 V okay so what do I mean by two-sided ideal generated by a set it's simply the smallest two-sided ideal that contains that set. Uh, to see that it exists, you just take the 
intersection of all two-sided ideals that contain itself. An intersection of two-sided ideals is again a two-sided ideal. So, so now I can define the exterior algebra wedge V is defined to be T V modulo I. Okay. Now, before we start studying uh, wedge V, let's look at this ideal I a little more closely. The most fundamental fact about I is <coughs> that um, I basically has vectors of this form. For all V and W in V, the tensor V tensor W plus W tensor V belongs to I. Um, this is very easy. It just follows from the fact that I is an additive abelian subgroup of T V. So if you take V plus W tensor V plus W, sorry, V plus W tensor V plus W, that's obviously in I by definition of I. It's some vector tensored with itself. But then this is equal to V tensor V plus V tensor W plus W tensor V plus W tensor W. So this is in I. Now among these four terms, this term is in I. So if I remove it also, what remains will be in I. And this term is in I. So what remains in the middle, this is in I, which is exactly what I started off to prove. And we'll use this observation uh, when we are trying to understand the exterior algebra. Okay, <clears throat> so firstly, I'll, um, we want to understand the basis of a wedge DF uh, of a vector space. So we're going to look at V equals Fn now, and we want to understand the basis of wedge DFn. Okay, so firstly, a first approximation of this is that uh, wedge DFn is spanned by. Okay, uh, just to distinguish between vectors in um, uh, TDN and uh, wedge DN, I will use a certain notation. I'll say V I one uh, V. 1 wedge VD denotes the image of V1 tensor VD belongs to TDV in wedge D. So what is wedge DV? It's just the image of TDV modulo I. Okay, I claim that wedge DFn is spanned by vectors of the form EI1 wedge EID where I1, uh, we can take these things to actually be in increasing order. So why is this? Basically, we are going to do certain moves. So we are going to start with a general vector in. Um, um, so clearly, you know, um, T D F N is spanned by uh, E I one tensor E I D, where we don't have any order on I one I D. So they are just elements between one to n. And then what we'll say is that by modifying this element TDFN by elements of I, we will be able to arrive at an element where these indices are in strictly increasing order. So the basic idea is the following. So let's look at an example of such a reduction. So suppose you have um, E3 wedge E5 wedge E2. This belongs to T um, three, let's say F seven. 
sorry wedge 3 epsilon but let's not do that let's write it as a tensor product okay e3 tensor e5 tensor e2 this belongs to t3 f7 fine and now i can write this as uh, e3 uh, tensor e2 tensor e5 plus e3 tensor e5 tensor e2 plus e3 tensor e2 tensor e5 I have not really done anything here. I have just uh, added and subtracted E3 tensor E2 tensor E5. But let's club these two things together. This is minus E3 tensor E2 tensor E5 plus E3 tensor E5 tensor E2 plus E2 tensor E5. Now in this previous lemma, we saw that v tensor w plus w tensor v is an i for any vector v vectors v and w and v so this thing belongs to i this thing belongs to i and but then you are left multiplying by something in e3 so this whole thing belongs to i so what we are saying is that this is congruent to minus e3 tensor e2 tensor E5 modulo I. So, by successively interchanging adjacent terms, by successively interchanging adjacent terms, we can start with E1 tensor E i d we can show that using some sort of something similar to the bubble sort algorithm which you may have seen by successively interchanging uh, consecutive terms in a list you can take the list and turn it into a sorted list in increasing order this is the same as E j 1 tensor ejd where these j1 j2 jd are the same as these indices e1 e2 i1 i2 id but they are written in uh, weekly increasing order but now suppose two of these um, uh, indices are equal if uh, jr is equal to jr plus 1 for some r then we have uh, this thing e j 1 tensor and then we have e j r tensor e j pl r plus 1 which is also e j r and then some other stuff but this stuff is in i um, just by definition of i and therefore since i is a two sided ideal even if you multiply something in i on the left and right by things in i you get a two sided ideal uh, an element of i so this whole thing is in i so this belongs to i and so this is congruent to zero mod i so the only uh, terms that survive are where j1 is strictly less than j2 is strictly less than jd therefore the images therefore ei1 then eid is either 0 or plus or minus ej1 wedge ejd where j1 is strictly less than in wedge d fn since the um, image of a basis is a basis uh, this uh, is of a, of a basis uh, of a vector space 
uh, modulo or subspace um, is a generating set this is a generating set so ej1 spans wedge tf ah here this should be a plus or minus ej1 ejd because each time you change interchange to consecutive um, tensors sign flips okay now we are ready to uh, prove the somewhat more um, difficult result that um, the image so let's this wedge tfn recall is the image of tdfn in wedge fn is um, has a basis e i one wedge e i n e i d where one less than or equal to i one less than i d less than or equal to n. This we can call a theorem. And we've already seen that this set uh, spans wedge dfn. We want to show that these elements are actually linearly independent. In order to do that, it's convenient uh, to use um, somewhat set theoretic notation. So, uh, so given a subset i of n, uh, write i in increasing order. Let's say i has d elements. Then you write e i to be defined to be e i one wedge e i. So what I'm basically saying is that collections of strictly increasing indices between one to n are the same as subsets of the set one to n. And so what we want to show is that e i i subset of n cardinality of i equals d is a basis of wedge df well the proof goes as follows uh, well what do we need to show so given scalars a i i in n i d and these a i should be in f if summation a i e i equals 0 then a i equals 0 for all i this is what we have to show so what we'll do is we will uh, multiply this by another element so let's say fix uh, one of these i's let's call it j Okay, and now you take this thing summation a i e i and then you so this is I leave out the index of summation here it just gets cumbersome wedge e j complement. So uh, let's look at this element. So this is equal to summation over i using distributivity e i a i then e i wedge e j complement. Now um, if uh, i is not equal to j then i being a subset of size d and j being a subset of size d as well so j complement is a subset of size n minus d. I will have at least one element in common with j complement right so if i is not equal to j then i has an element in common with j complement and so e i wedge e j complement will be zero except when i is equal to j 
So this just becomes summation, uh, no summation, all the terms die out except aj, ej, wedge, ej complement. And uh, by sorting out these elements, we can say that this is the same as ai, e1, wedge, en. Okay. Um, firstly, uh, one thing I should have said before is that uh, uh, if if uh, n is greater than d, then of course all these. Um, if d is greater than n, then of course um, none of these elements e i can be non-zero. So we are restricting ourselves to the case where a d is less than or equal to n. Okay, so we get this e i times. Uh, e1 wedge, uh, e2 wedge, en. And I want to show that this uh, vector e1 wedge, e2 wedge, en is non-zero because if I can show that, then that means that, uh, well, we know that summation ai, ei is zero. So then this would imply that ai is zero. So I want to show that a1, sorry, e1 wedge e2 wedge en is non zero in wedge n so um how do you prove this this is a very interesting proof it actually uses uh, the notion of determinant so what i'm going to do is i'm going to show that um Mm. So, so this is equivalent to saying that uh, the claim is equivalent to saying that wedge n f n is not a zero dimensional vector space. Why is that? Because we know that wedge n f n is spanned by this vector e1, e2, wedge e n. Uh, we saw that in the previous lemma. So, if this vector is zero, then wedge n f n will be zero. So this claim is equivalent to showing that wedge and fn is not zero. But I will prove this that wedge and fn is not zero using a uh, determinant. So we have this map determinant and it's a map from um, matrices, n by n matrices uh, to f. But I will think of it as a map from tdfn to f. How does it work? If you have a vector v1 tensor vd, then it goes to determinant of the matrix whose columns are the column vectors v1, v2. Sorry, uh, I want this n, n, vn, because then this is a square matrix and we can take its determinant. This gives rise, um, well, so firstly, you know that the determinant is multilinear in the column. So this gives rise to a well-defined linear map from the tensor product, the nth tensor power of Fn to F. And um, this is a non-zero map because there are uh, non-zero linear map. Because, well, there are matrices with non-zero determinants, such as the identity matrix. And uh, the other fact that we know is that determinant uh, restricted to TNFN intersection I is zero. Why is that? Well, this just corresponds to the fact that if you have a matrix, two of whose columns are equal, then its determinant is zero. So this determinant will uh, vanish on any matrix which is um, in TNF and intersect I because determinant vanishes on matrices with two equal columns.
so then what we know is that so determinant induces determinant bar from tnfn mod tnfn intersect i to f and this is non zero so determinant gives rise to a non trivial linear functional from tnfn mod tnfn intersect i to f but this is the same as wedge nfn to f so determinant gives rise to a non trivial non zero linear functional on the vector space wedge nfn but if the vector space wedge nfn were zero it couldn't possibly have a non zero linear functional therefore we conclude that wedge nfn is not zero and therefore e1 wedge e2 wedge en is a non zero vector in wedge nfn so what we get is that zero is ai times a non zero vector therefore ai is equal to zero and hence these uh, so we can do this for every i and hence we see that this ei as i runs over subsets of size d in n forms a basis of wedge dfn let us take a closer look at the ideal i so the ideal i is the two sided ideal generated by v tensor v v n v this is a two sided ideal in tv and of course so this ideal contains all vectors of the form v tensor v but it also contains uh tensors of the form v1 tensor v2 tensor and then at some place you have a uh, vk tensor vk and then you have tensor vd minus 1 this would be a tensor in tdv i claim that the ideal i is actually the span of v1 tensor vk minus 1 tensor vk tensor vk vd minus 1 where v1 vd minus 1 belongs to you. uh as d runs over all um well let's just say d greater than or equal to 1 and uh, this is uh, easy to see because firstly clearly i would contain all these vectors because it contain vk tensor vk and it's closed under uh, left and right multiplication by elements of tv and secondly you just see that this span is actually an ideal so a two sided ideal and so i is the span a consequence of this is that i is the direct sum over d greater than or equal to 0 i intersect tdv that means i itself is a sum of its intersections with the different degree d components of tensors and a corollary of that is that wedge uh, v which is tdv uh, not tdv tv mod i is equal to direct sum d greater than or equal to 0 tdv mod i intersect tdv and this we have seen is wedge d in fact uh, wedge dv is 0 if d is greater than or equal to dimension v and so what we have is wedge fn is equal to this that sum d equals 0 to n wedge d fn and this wedge d fn is the span of subsets of size d of fn so what we have is that um finally wedge fn 
has basis e i um, i subset of n. Now these subsets could have size anything from zero to n, and um, you can write down the product of two such basis elements by taking the words. Uh, so if you have e i wedge e j, then you can write down the words, uh, the the elements of. So this is going to be zero if um, uh, I intersect J is non-empty, and if I intersect J is empty, then this will be plus or minus E of I union J. Otherwise, the sign has to be worked out when you concatenate uh, the words corresponding to I and J, and then you try to sort them back into increasing order. You have to see how many times you have to switch um, successive terms. So that's the algebra, the exterior algebra, also known as the Grassmann algebra. Now suppose A is a matrix with entries in F. Let's say it's an M by N matrix. Then A defines a linear map which I'll also denote by A from Fn to Fm. And what this linear map does is A Ej. So let's take for Fm the basis E1 En and let's take for Fm the basis F1 up to Fm. And A Ej is summation i goes from 1 to m A i j f i. So this is the usual way in which we think of matrices as linear maps. Now this A also gives rise to a linear map Tfm Tfn to Tfm as follows. I'll define it on basis vectors. Ta of Ei1 tensor Eid is Tei1 tensor, not T, Aei1 tensor Aeid. This linear map has uh, the property that Ta of V1 tensor Vd is AV1 tensor AVD for any V1 Vd in F. Okay, so one interesting feature of this map is that if you take something like uh, V1 tensor, Vr tensor, you have this thing repeated, then this is, uh, this is uh, these kinds of vectors span uh, the two-sided ideal uh, Who's, by which we take the quotient to get the exterior algebra. So this is an uh, ideal in, uh, this is a vector in I, I, just to be specific here, I'll say I, F, um, N. And uh, if you apply uh, T, D of A to this, Then this will be A V1 tensor and again you will have A V R tensor, A V R tensor. A V D minus 1 which belongs to I F M. So what we have is that T D A takes 
i f n to i f n and therefore t d a induces a linear map which i'll denote by wedge d a from t d a mod i f m to t d a mod i f m so this is a map from wedge d f m to wedge d f m so what we've seen is that every matrix also induces a linear map on uh, the exterior algebra So the question I want to ask now is what is the matrix of this linear transformation wedge D A? What do I mean exactly by that? What I mean is that you take this wedge D A and so this wedge D A goes from wedge D F N to wedge D F M and so we, uh, we take a basis vector of wedge D F N. So we take, um, so we had taken for the basis of F N we had taken E1, E2, E M. So we take a basis vector for this would be of the form E j for some j uh, subset of n, and then this is a vector in wedge D F m, and so we expand it in terms of the basis that we have for wedge D F m. So this is going to be summation over i subset of m a i j f i. So this system of uh, constants a i j indexed by i subset of m j subset of n I'll call refer to this as the matrix of wedge D A. If you somehow um, order the subsets of m and the subsets of n. Um, maybe here these are size of i is d size of j is d so if you take all the subsets of size d and order them somehow then this becomes uh, you can really write this as a matrix whose uh, the number of rows will be m choose d and number of columns will be n choose d so you can think of this as an m choose d times n choose d matrix but let's just think of it as a system of coefficients defined by this uh, equation here for every subset g of n okay so to figure out this matrix is not very difficult uh, so let's just write out unwind the definitions so what happens if we start with wedge d a and then apply it to e j 1 wedge e j so we started with a j which is a subset of n d well by definition this is going to be a e j 1 wedge a e j d okay now let's expand all these things so this first thing is going to be summation i1 equals 1 to m a i1 j1 f i1 wedge i2 equals 1 to m a i2 j2 f i2 and so on up to i d equals 1 to m a i d j d 
f i d and if we pull out all the constants we'll get this multiple sum i1 equals 1 to m i2 equals 1 to m id equals 1 to m and then we get this product of coefficients i1 j1 a i2 j2 a i d j d and then finally we get our vectors which are f i1 which f i d but i want to these these things are not linearly independent if i take some of these vectors and uh, if two of them if if two of these i's are equal then it's going to be zero in a uh, wedge d of uh, uh, f m and also if uh, these are not in increasing order when i reorder them they will uh, there will be a sign change so if i account for that i can rewrite the sum as sum over 1 less than or equal to i1 less than i2 less than id less than or equal to m and then all the possible reorderings of the vector if two indices are the same then this thing is zero so i don't worry about those cases but all possible reorderings means i need to go over permutations in sd and every time i interchange two of these uh, factors there's a sign change and that corresponds to the sign of the permutation w in sd and then i get a i w1 j1 a i w d j d but this and uh, yeah this is the coefficient of uh, the term f i1 f i d so this is exactly what we were looking for so we were looking for the coefficient of such a term therefore a i j is precisely the determinant this thing here is a determinant it's a determinant of what a sub matrix of the original matrix a it's a determinant of the sub matrix of a obtained by choosing rows according to the subset i and choosing columns according to the subset j so what we have is the formula wedge d a applied to ej is summation i subset of m determinant of aij fi so this is the formula which shows how wedge d a acts on um, wedge d f m so this determinant is what is often called a d by d minor of the matrix a so what i'm saying is that the uh, matrix entries of the linear map wedge d a are the d by d minors of the linear map a itself now suppose i have two matrices A belongs to M. M by M F. B belongs to. Let's say M by N F. And B belongs to M N by L F, where M N and L are three possibly different um, positive integers. Then you can multiply these two matrices, and A B will belong to A M by L F. And so we have T A from tfn to tfm we have tb from tfl 
to Tfn. And what is clear from the definition of Ta and Tb is that T of the product matrix AB is Ta composed with Tb. Just see how it acts on basis vectors. And so also wedge of AB is wedge of A composed with wedge of B. Okay, so now let's see how these are related to the matrices. So, um, so suppose you take some k subset of the set 1 to L and the size of k is D and we ask what is wedge D A B when it is applied to E k. Okay, uh, this is on the one hand given by uh, k by k, uh, sorry d by d minors of the matrix A B. So, this is summation i subset of m determinant of A B i k f i. On the other hand, it is a composition of matrices of minors. So, on the other hand, this is wedge d a applied to wedge d b applied to e k. But this is just wedge d a applied to summation j subset of n determinant of b uh, j k the minor of b corresponding to rows j and columns k e j just by what we did earlier and then we apply wedge d a to this and we get summation over i subset of m summation j subset of n and then we get determinant of a subscript i j determinant of B subscript J K F yeah maybe uh, I shouldn't have called this E K let's call it G K so let's take uh, F to the L has basis G 1 G 2 G L then So, the conclusion that we draw from all this is that the determinant of you take the product of a matrix and take its i kth d by d minor where i and k are subsets of um, the rows and columns of you know i is a subset of uh, k is a subset of l and i is a subset of uh, 1 to m then you get that this is sum over all subsets j of n of size d determinant of a i j determinant of p j k for all i of size d k of size d i subset of m k subset of n this beautiful um, identity involving minors of a product of exp expressing the minors of a product of two matrices in terms of the minors of the matrices themselves.